77% of our guests have not heard of the Our Water, Our World program. So I'm impressed that almost 25% have, so right on. Uh, we have um, the, pri primarily we have, uh, that's very even to new gardeners, uh, people that have been gardening for a few years and feeling pretty good about it as, uh, you know, green thumb lifetimers. So that's pretty balanced. So this is wonderful. And then as far as which beneficial insects we're interested in learning about today, of course, uh, I threw in all of them at the last minute because I had a feeling that that would just be like, yeah, let's just pick them all. But um, so uh, over 80% of us are interested in learning about all of them. Well, we're not going to be, I won't be able to cover all of them today, but I'm going to cover a really good uh, amount. So, um, all right, let's, let me close some of my screens so I can see what's going on. I feel like, um, Kellen, what do you think? Should we get started or should we give it another minute? Um, how about, I think we've kind of started to settle here. Um, so why don't we go ahead and get started and folks can join us um, as they as they do, but. Okay, great. I am going to go ahead and thank you everyone for participating in our, participating in our poll. It's always a lot of fun. Um, you know, of course we try to make it as interactive as possible and we're all used to this now. So, all right, let me start the recording. I've started it already. Oh, great, thanks. Yeah. Helen, you're awesome. Yeah, so our program today is going to be recorded. Uh, it will be uh, located on the City of Santa Rosa website. We will let you know where to find that after we have landed it somewhere. Okay, and welcome everyone to yeah. Garden for the Good Bugs. And uh, I can do a quick intro about you, Suzanne, since people oh. might not know who you are. Okay. Um, and a little bit of housekeeping just about how the Q&A will work and everything. So um, this is Suzanne Bontempo. She's fabulous. You'll all love her. Um, she has been a gardener professionally for over 20 years and now really focuses on education, garden education, and specifically related to integrated pest management. Um, so she knows all sorts of different things about how to make sure that your garden is as healthy as possible without necessarily needing to turn to a more toxic chemical. Um, so looking at different organic options and cultural options and ways to take care of your garden that um, are more healthy for yourself and for the environment and ultimately makes a you know, healthier, happier plants too. So that's really her specialty, um, knows lots. And so you're probably gonna have lots of really interesting questions come up um, as this presentation goes on. And here's what I would love to see. Most of you are probably pretty familiar with Zoom at this point in our interesting life, um, but uh, you're all muted right now and that's on purpose so that we can just reduce the amount of background noise and everything. Um, but when you have a question, there's two different ways you can put that out to us. We are gonna have a Q&A session at the end. So if it's a question that you feel is gonna need a little bit more discussion, um, and you want to get it some one-on-one -on -one with Suzanne about that, go ahead and pop that in the Q&A, which is going to be down at the bottom of your screen. You might have to kind of move your mouse to, uh, to make the little bar pop up. If you have a question that is um, prohibiting you from understanding what's going on, there was a word you didn't know, or you had a, you know, you just wanted to share something with the group about something she said, oh, I know where to get that product or, you know, whatever, um, you can pop that to the chat. And so the chat will be sort of a more like, as we go, oh, I'm hearing from some people that the sound is fuzzy. Um, mm. So anyways, hopefully that gets better. I can, uh, be turning off my heater, maybe that helps. Um, so yeah, if you have a more urgent question or you just wanna share a comment, the chat's the way to go for that. But all the other questions we will answer at the end. Um, we, are, we are planning to end at 11 but our Q&A will go after that. So those folks who need to go at 11, feel free to just jump off. Um, and if you can stay and wanna to listen to the questions, that will be afterwards. And we also have Heather here, who maybe Suzanne, I don't know. Uh, here we go, yeah. So we've got Heather from the Water Use Efficiency Department. 
Um, Suzanne works for Our Water, Our World. I work for the city of Santa Rosa along with Heather. And uh, the city is actually sponsoring this program. We're really uh, proud to be able to sponsor this so that you all can learn. And so Heather is going to just share a little bit of information about the drow um, as it's related to gardening. And you know, as for all of you gardeners, this will be relevant information. So I'm going to go ahead and mute and turn my video off and hand it over to them. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here as well. Um, I am here with my my little gardener. So if you see any hands popping up, <laughs> it's from the little one. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit about the drought. And obviously, the drought is spurred from a while of uh, no rain and really low reservoirs in our watershed. So on May 18th, this last Tuesday, City Council adopted a 20% community-wide reduction. And that's basically if the community can band together, it means that we don't have to go into a mandatory reduction, uh, which none of us want to do either. So uh, the current 20% community-wide reduction means that we know there's a good chunk of the community that are already our super savers that are have gone above and beyond to save water and do everything they can in their house. We are not asking those people to reduce by 20% right now. Um, we're gonna go and try to reach out to the people who can reduce by 20% right now. And in order to do that, we're going to use our resources and rebates to get to people and help anyone that wants it. So, oh, um, the drought, you can follow any of these links. The srcd.org slash drought will keep updated on any of the drought information. Uh, our resources online, you can go to srcd.org slash water smart and we have many resources to help you stay water smart. We also have a lot of rebates. So I'll quickly go over, we have some rebates for removing your lawn and installing low water use plants. That would be our biggest water saver. And rainwater harvesting, gray water installation, most common is laundry to landscape. We also, I think the, the quickest way you could save water right now is checking your irrigation timer and you could use our srcity.org slash watering recommendations page but that is based off of weather in Santa Rosa so if you're outside of Santa Rosa you may need to adjust that according to your microclimate um, but it's a good place to start and most people we come across are over watering so you can help save water and help your plants out by applying the perfect amount of water that they need. Also, as we continue through this drought, we, people are much more aware of this issue. And so if you see people wasting water according to our water waste ordinance, then you can report it at srcity.org slash water waste, as you see on the screen. Now, water waste is things like broken irrigation. You see a sprinkler head missing and gushing water. Um, overspray that's flowing into the street and gutter. If it's overspray onto the sidewalk, um, irrigation systems are not 100% efficient and going to always, you, you, sometimes with the turf, you just can't get it in. So a little overspray onto the sidewalk is unfortunately usually going to happen um, but covering the sidewalk and into the gutter we want to help them um, if they also have any other large leak that they know of then we will address that too and you can report that to us and we'll look into it um, <clears throat> right now what is not water waste would be the neighbor who's irrigating their lawn every day or for longer periods of time. 
but um, we do want to help that person as well to save water. So if you want to communicate with us, we will try to reach out to them. We have uh, free water audits. And so we can encourage the customer to let us help come out and help them learn how to schedule their timer well and look for any um, issues within their landscape that we can help them save water and make them more efficient that way. So we will help them instead of um, report those customers, but still give it to us. Awesome. If you have any questions, you can email us at watersmart at srcity.org. I didn't put that on here, sorry. That's all in the um, resource page that I emailed out to everyone this morning. All of these, um, this entire uh, list of links and information is on the gardening resource page that I emailed out to everyone this morning, and I can email it out again after the program. So Heather, thank you so much. Thank We're you. also going to be talking a lot about how to protect our gardens through a drought on our next program, which is scheduled for June 12th, I believe. And we'll get that information for you as well. So anyway, oh, let's know, get, I'm sorry. I would like to say that we, in, we um, the last drought we had, we had a lot of people that ended up letting their trees die. And we do want to encourage you to water your plants efficiently and don't mm -hmm trees die because the trees are so important so giving them a deep drink yeah needed. we're going to definitely talk about how to manage our landscapes and our gardens through a drought on the next program which goes into a lot of information on how to effectively use the water and get the most out of our water while keeping our garden happy and healthy so we've got a lot to cover so i want to just jump right in we're going to go through slides for about 50 minutes I know that's a lot. I'm going to try to make it as fast, like cut it down to about 45, but we are going to learn about who are many of the common bugs in our garden, how they're helping us and how to keep them around. It's going to be a lot of fun. So for those of you that are not familiar with our Water Our World program, I am the program manager. So I have to give our Water Our World program a little shout out also uh, because uh, that's why we're here in partnership with the City of Santa Rosa. So Our Water Our World is a program designed to bring awareness between pesticides and water quality. And we are an integrated pest management educational program. We help people uh, in the aisle and with our uh, retailers throughout the uh, city and county uh, solve their pest problems with a less toxic approach. So you might recognize some of our materials, which you can get uh, more information on our website. And just um, the, one of the main reasons why Our Water, Our World exists is because we really care about our water and understand that uh, all the water and all the snow that um, falls on California, if it does not get absorbed into the ground, it will find its way to a watershed. In our case, it's the Russian River uh, watershed. And along the way, as it's finding its way to a stream, a creek, a river, and then eventually out to the ocean, it is picking up debris with it. So that is going to include chemicals, pesticides, litter, pet waste, things like that. So how it relates to our gardens is when we're using um, chemicals, pesticides around the outside, understand There'll be residuals, synthetic fertilizers and conventional pesticides linger and with overspray or with any rains or when we're like uh, power washing the house or washing our car, all these chemicals are going to end up getting into the storm drain. And understand inside the house, uh, when we're using um, any type of products that aren't plant-based or biodegradable, they also will end up in the waterways through our sinks or laundry or showers and so forth. And they are not treated and removed at the treatment facilities. So just sharing that uh, we're here to help you make a better choice and understand when it comes to pest management, Integrated pest management is a science-based decision-making process that helps us look at the system as a whole. In this case, today we're talking about our gardens. And it also helps us identify what the problem is. Oftentimes what we see are the symptoms of a problem. And then from there, we identify and evaluate if it's a problem we can live with. Is it going to be short term? Is it going to correct itself? And if we need to take actions, then we look at a combination of controls, such as cultural controls, bolstering the health of the garden, mechanical controls. These are the tools we use to prevent pest problems, such as like maybe uh, gopher baskets or uh, 
um, deer fencing. Um, maybe we're going to blast aphids off with some water, although we're going to try to do that very strategically to save water. Um, biological controls are using living organisms to manage pest problems. And that's really what we're talking about today. And then chemical controls are the pesticides. And we always wanna use these as a last resort as minimal as possible. And we always wanna choose the least toxic. And remember, if it is a plant that has always struggled and has not performed to your liking, give yourself permission just to remove it. Cause then when we remove something that isn't working for us, we can then plant something that is going to work for us. So how does IPM uh, what is the connection with beneficial insects? Well, let's look at that. First, we're going to understand that proper identification is key. Then we want to set our gardens up for success. Uh, we want to grow a lot of biodiversity, and then we want to reduce and eliminate pesticide usage. So let's look at what that is. So I'm going to start by uh, testing your knowledge. So I hope everyone's ready. Um, I'd like everyone to find the raised hand uh, icon, the button on your screen. Go ahead and raise your hand so I can see. Yeah, all right. Got a lot of raised hands. Awesome. All right. So everyone feels really good where the raised hand is. All right. So we're going to get started. This is a really fun game that I hope you are going to like. So um, you see this critter in the garden. Are we going to squish it or not? Are we going to squish it? Let's raise our hand if we're going to squish it. Let's raise, okay, we got a lot of squished hands. Yeah, we're going to squish this guy because he looks really weird. All right, anybody else want to squish it? All right. All right, we see this one. This one's really freaky looking, right? It's got these spines. It's got piercing mouth parts. Ugh. Is it going to bite me? Are you going to squish it? Let's raise our hands if we're going to squish this one. All right. Yeah, I'd squish this one for sure. It's crazy looking. Okay. All right. Now we see this one in the garden. Ooh, it's like slimy. It's little. Is it a slug? Who's going to squish this one? Yeah, we've got a lot of people that are going to squish this one. <sighs> yeah, I do. <clears throat> I definitely would squish it. All right. Got one more. This is our last one. This one looks like a little alien. How many of us are going to squish this one? Yeah, we got a lot of people. Squish it, squish it, squish it. Anybody else want to squish it? Okay. Well, guess what? Those are all beneficial insects. Can you believe it? I know. And I've accidentally squished them before, not knowing. So let's meet our friends. I uh, just like to share, we all know who this is kind of the showstopper, very iconic. This is our lady beetle, otherwise known as our ladybug. Understand that we've got over, well, around 450 species of ladybugs in North America. Isn't that wild? They're going to come with a variety of colors. Uh, they could be in different spot kind of patterns. It could be like all black with two red spots or all red or kind of all orange with just a couple spots. They even come in gray with um, dark, uh, black spots or even kind of like a khaki color with black spots. What they don't come in is green. They do not come in green with black spots. That's actually the diabrotica or cucumber beetle. And that one's actually a pest. But I'd like to share that they are predators. They are uh, going around uh, feeding on uh, little soft bodied insects. Those are going to be uh, insects such as aphids, um, maybe spider mites, uh, white fly nymphs and so forth. Scale insects, thrips. Uh, but they do a pretty good job eating insects. They can eat over 5,000 in their lifetime. And, but understand that they are just only going to stick around if there's food. So if we uh, think we have a lot of aphids, but really we just have like about, you know, I don't know, 25 or 30 on a plant uh, and that's it. 
that might not be enough aphids for ladybugs. They really want an infestation, which is kind of crazy. So give yourself a little bit of permission just to let the aphids get a little out of hand, push some limits. It might get weird, uh, but then we're going to see the uh, aphids, um, ladybugs come and they're going to start to devour them. I can also share that uh, we, they're all, the ladybugs also are going to be attracted to a variety of plants. So when we have a nice habitat for them that we've created that includes trees and shrubs and flowering perennials, uh, some of their favorite plants are going to be, you know, like buckwheat, such as in the picture here, or, um, you know, yarrow, uh, uh, sweet alyssum, anything that's got clusters of a lot of little flowers, we're also going to see them sticking around. All right. So this is our ladybug larva, and it looks really crazy. It looks a little bit like a small alligator. Um, they're going to be tiny anywhere from a quarter of an inch up to a little under half an inch. Um, maybe they don't quite get that large. And I'm sorry, I'm not able to uh, address the scale with any photos uh, very well because I don't have personal photos of all of our insects. So I'm doing my best by explaining with a ruler. So. Uh, these are going to be small, uh, but they are definitely recognizable. And again, similar to the adults, they're going to vary in color. So sometimes they're all black. Uh, most often they're going to be black with this dark kind of charcoaly gray with either orange or red kind of splotches on it. Sometimes stripes. Uh, sometimes it's instead of orange or red, it's lighter gray. So understand that they are all going to be cruising around. They're going to... Uh, be feeding on insects. They only want to eat insects at this stage of their life uh, for about two to four weeks while they're in this stage. Uh, they can eat upwards of hundreds of aphids and other soft bodied insects. And they are just, they, I like to call them the teenagers. They have teenage appetites. They are just going on the hunt looking for insects to eat. Now, this is the ladybug pupa. So from the larva, they will uh, uh, create or this little dome shaped form, which they will stay in from anywhere from um, five to 15 days. You see, you'll find them like on leaves or like on the side of a raised bed or on a fence, or in this case on a bamboo post. And you can even see the variety of colors. So all of these are ladybug pupas, anywhere from like primarily orange to primarily kind of a creamy or a dark gray. These are going to be the ladybug eggs. So the ladybug eggs are very specific looking. They are tiny. They look like kind of uh, goldish yellow footballs that are standing up on their point. And the adults are going to be laying the eggs uh, the adult female, pretty much from the very beginning of, um, well, late winter, when the temperatures start to warm, maybe March to April, all the way through the summer, and they could lay upwards of over a thousand eggs. And you'll see that they're usually laid where there is an aphid infestation. So that's what I'm talking about. If we can um, let aphids kind of uh, seeming like they're taking over. And then lo and behold, we're going to start to see the eggs. And then we're going to start to see the lady uh, beetle larva. And then we're going to start to see these aphid um, aphids uh, kind of go away. Even in this picture, you'll see there's a lot. This is the black bean aphid. And you'll see these little whitey things. Uh, those little whitey things are actually the skins from what they have already been consumed. All right, they will stay in an egg form for about three to five or well, two to five days. All right, now, how many of us recognize this friend? This is our green lacewing, uh, most recognizable by fluttering around the porch light at night. Uh, they are going to be cruising around our garden, flying very haphazardly. They are not graceful at all. I saw a few last night. Um, they look a little bit like they're, you know, off balance. Uh, they are feeding on pollen and nectar. They're also feeding on the sugary substances that um, aphids and other soft body uh, insects create, and that's called honeydew. So they like to feed off of that sugary honeydew as well in, as pollen and nectar. In fact, here's a lace wing in my garden feeding on the uh, nectar from one of my late season daffodils, which was kind of a treat to see. Now, 
This creepy crawler is our lacewing larva. And I want to share a couple of things. The lacewing larva is 100% a, a predator. So though the adult is not feeding off of insects, this little guy is, and he is tiny. He's as small as a fourth of an inch. And um, it is documented that they can get up to half an inch, but I've never seen them that large. They are really, really small. In fact, they are just about the length of two aphids. So, um, you know, so that's a little under half an inch. Now, these guys are really cool because they're so ferocious and they are just looking to consume insects. Uh, they pretty much can eat them at a rate of one per minute. They have a nickname called aphid lion and they have these piercing mouth parts and they've got these spines and they look really crazy. They will eat a very large variety of insects, including small insect eggs, small caterpillars, uh, white fly nymphs, aphids, thrips, um, mealybugs, uh, you name it, they're out there trying to find it and to devour it. It is just their whole time, which their lifespan is just a couple of weeks. So two to three weeks, they are going to be in this stage cruising around hunting. Now, this is really fun. When I did some research for this program years ago, there was a, a, a paper at a university, I believe it was Purdue, it could have been Cornell, I don't remember right now, but it was a, um, there was a study done on the lacewing larva and it was it's documented that they were seen going in and eating some aphids, taking that shell, that skin of the aphid that we saw in the other picture, throwing it on his back onto one of its spikes as a camouflage to come in to eat more aphids. Isn't that wild? These guys are smart. I just wanna make sure I'm covering all the good points for you. So it is so fun. I'm ex exceptionally, I just get so excited and thrilled when I see them. Now I get really excited and thrilled when I see these. Do you see what I'm looking at? These are lacewing eggs. Now, lacewings are really smart. They have, uh, they are known, they have learned over the years, over the centuries to lay their eggs. Their eggs are very tiny, about a quarter of an inch, uh, even maybe a little smaller on this little stock that is also about a quarter of an inch. And if so that when that egg hatches, the larva walk down that little stock and start eating other insects. Now, if all the eggs were lined up, just on the leaf, the way the um, ladybug eggs were, that first one to emerge would eat all of the other eggs. So that is why this is so cool. They have discovered that they can put their eggs up on a stalk to prevent um, them from eating the other eggs. Now here's another picture. This is the ladybug larva, all black, eating some aphids and we see a lacewing. So the lacewings are only going to lay their eggs where there is an infestation of food because they know once the um, eggs hatch that those aphid lions are going to be on the hunt. So that's another reason why we wanna leave some aphids around. All right, does anyone recognize this friend? This is one of my most, my most favorites. I see them following me around the garden all the time. This is the serpent fly or hover fly, also known as a flower fly. This is not a bee. Uh, something to take note is that this is a true fly. You see it only has two wings, a set of wings, whereas uh, a bee will have uh, four wings, two sets. So that's one uh, discerning factor. Another is, is that this is not a bee or a wasp, so it does not have a stinger. It does not want to swarm us. Uh, it is not trying to, um, you know, harm us in any way. It is really just out there pollinating flowers. It is a very important pollinator. Um, there's hundreds of species in North America. It's pretty fun, and they range in a variety of sizes from very, very tiny, what is it, a quarter of an inch all the way up to three quarter of an inch. So, it's kind of tr it's kind of fun to check them out. They're also going to be in a variety of colors. They're always going to have this markings on it that resemble a wasp or a fly. However, keep in mind they are just um, I'm sorry, resemble a bee or uh, a wasp, but they are a true fly.
They will dart around our gardens like a helicopter. So this is probably how you'll recognize them now. Well, they'll be hovering and they'll like dart over here and then they're hovering and then they dart over there and they kind of zip around uh, always on top of the flowers. Now their favorite flowers are going to be sweet alyssum, uh, yarrow, as in this picture. Uh, they do like nepeta or catmint, uh, as well as cilantro flowers and parsley flowers. Whenever I let my cilantro go to flower, which is pretty much the only reason why I plant cilantro nowadays, is because it bolts so quickly. But the flowers are amazing, and you'll see lots of these uh, uh, swarming the cilantro flowers, as well as parsley and dill. It's kind of cool. Now, this is our hoverfly or serpent fly larva. Now, because we're talking about a fly, the larva is actually considered a maggot, not a word we like to use, right? So here's the cool thing. It is going to be pretty tiny and depending on the stage of its life, it could either be anywhere from a uh, 32nd of an inch all the way up to half an inch. So a 32nd of an inch is very, very tiny. Um, but here's the cool thing about them. It is going to be the only worm-like organism that's going to be on our leaves or on our um, plants next to bugs that has a white stripe down its back. So regardless of the color, which it can range in color from lime green to kind of a khaki tan all the way to kind of an opaque. And let me tell you, I have seen these already on my roses and I almost did wipe one off the other day, but I took a closer look. It is a little confusing sometimes because I also have the rose slug on the leaves, but, and that's the skeletonizer that's actually eating um, the tissue from the leaves, leaving kind of like a lacy uh, leaf behind skeletonizing the leaves, but this is typically going to be on the stems, uh, hunting aphids. And what you'll see if you go out like at dusk and you go and look at your roses or other plants looking for um, a little aphid infestation, take a closer look, typically you'll see him and he's just gonna be there perched up kind of like a cobra. And then he goes in and grabs that aphid and then snacks on it like popcorn. It's kind of fun. They're also going to eat other insects like scale insects and thrips. So because of this, I always plant sweet alyssum around my roses at the base of my roses to ensure that I'm going to have hoverflies laying their eggs on my roses so that I can have some nice, you know, beneficial insects uh, preying on the pests of my roses and other plants around my garden. Now these are the eggs. The eggs are also going to be really tiny. You see it's about the size of an aphid, about a 32nd of an inch. We'll see them laid individually around clusters of aphids. So this is something else to be on the lookout. So before you go for that pesticide, before you go for that insecticidal soap, take a closer look and see if we've got any friends there because trust me, they're going to do a much better job at managing these pests than any pesticide would do. Now, this strange looking alien is a mealy bug destroyer. And I am so excited to talk to you about them today, specifically because I just recently saw one in real life. So these guys are tiny. The adult is a lady beetle. So um, it's in the ladybug family. Very, very tiny, just about a quarter of an inch, uh, always going to be black with this red head and uh, cruising around just on the hunt for mealybugs and other insects like the scale and the aphids and such, but their favorite is mealybugs. Now the larva, which is this weird cotton candy, you know, shaggy, looks like a mop maybe, um, this is the larva. And it is cruising around very quickly, also on the hunt for insects. Now it loves mealybugs, but it's also going to love aphids and scale insects and spider mites and all those other pests that we don't like. Now, here's the thing. Uh, they have a very short lifespan, only about two to four months, but they can eat hundreds of soft bodied insects. Um, they're super mobile. So you're gonna see them cruising around. They um, 
they are going to do a very good job eating the pest insects. So yet another reason why we want to avoid using pesticides. But because that ladybug, I'm sorry, that mealybug destroyer looks so much like a mealybug, oftentimes it's mistaken and it's targeted as a pest. So, um, and sadly pesticides are used. Uh, but check this out. I was so excited. I was finally cutting down my aphid infested fava beans and look what I found. Mealybug destroyers with ladybug destroyers on the hunt, cruising around eating aphids. It was so fun. Yeah, that mealybug destroyer on the top yellow arrow is eating an aphid. I was thrilled. So you see they are smaller than the ladybug larvas. These happen to be very mature ladybug larvas. So they're on the larger size, but they were moving very quickly. So check it out. It was hard to believe, but yes, lo and behold, I got to see them with my own two eyes, which was very fun. Now, this is really strange. Has anybody had this experience where they've seen a tomato hornworm with like these little cotton balls on their back? These are parasitic wasps. Parasitic wasps are wasps that spend a par portion of their life as a parasite on or in an insect, uh, on a host. It's very strange, okay? So there are several hundred species of parasitic wasps and uh, they range in size and color. However, when I say they range in size, I'm talking, they are very, very tiny hardly recognizable to the human eye and typically mistaken as like a gnat or a tiny fly. So these are going to be, uh, their whole intention for their whole goal in life is strictly to lay eggs in or on a host insect. Once that egg hatches, it will then consume that insect typically from the inside. Now, because they are uh, looking to lay their eggs in or on, that means they are very minuscule, tiny. So these are not the type of wasps we think of when we think of yellow jackets. These do not have a stinger. They do not swarm us. There is nothing here that has anything to do with us. It is all about them looking for pests. Now the type of pest they can control is aphid scale insects, leaf hoppers, caterpillars, as in the tomato hornworm in the bottom left picture. Um, cockroaches, flies, beetles, white flies, even ticks. It is a very large range. So that is why we love them. Uh, even uh, psyllids, um, you know, a very large range. So this is very exciting. I'm not sure if you've ever seen this, but these are aphid mummies. So what happens? What does this mean? The parasitic wasp has laid its egg inside an aphid. That egg hatches, it burrows the inside of that aphid out, feeding off of it, and then will emerge as an adult, cutting a perfect circle on that puffed aphid shell to emerge as an adult uh, wasp. So you see the picture on the right. This is actually camellia leaves with an incredible uh, volume of aphid mummies. So I have seen one or two, never to this capacity. This was very exciting when this sample was brought into a garden center that I happened to be working at one day. The manager brought it over because they knew I'd be thrilled to see it. We were just like so excited. Um, yeah, we get very excited when we see beneficial insects. Um, but the, here's the thing. If we happen to see this, please trust that the parasitic wasps have taken care of the aphids for you. So we don't want to kill whatever is present. If there's aphids that are left, understand they very, very well may have an egg inside them that is going to take care of the problem. Here's the other cool thing. This is where they got the idea for that movie Aliens with Sigourney Weaver, that movie that's really scary. I don't know if you've seen it lately, but um, yeah, kind of fun. All right. This, I've been getting a lot of emails about this guy. He's cruising around. He's our soldier beetle uh, related to the lightning bug or firefly, though they do not have that light producing organ. Um, they are cruising around. They're also flying around. Uh, they're pretty big, about half an inch. They are pollinating. 
They are uh, enjoying the pollen and nectar of plants. They are pollinating our flowers. They are also eating some pests as well as the sugary secretions of those pests. They are not harming the flowers. They are not harming the leaves. I have heard over my years that people proudly like to say that they have just killed all of these beetles that were in their plum tree or whatever. And I had to break the news that they were actually the soldier beetles, which are beneficial. And they were eating those aphids. They were eating those scale insects and thrips and such. Um, here's the deal. They are usually one of the first in the spring, late winter to emerge, to start cruising around. And their larva, we rarely ever see because they're always in the ground. The larva is going to be ground dweller while the soldier beetle adult is going to be above ground, uh, cruising around, pollinating so forth. Now that larva looks like a, uh, the, like a small alligator, similar to the um, ladybug larva, but it also looks a little strange. It almost looks like a ladybug larva and an earwig, uh, immature earwig kind of like were merged. So you might see them. They can be fairly large, up to three quarters of an inch, but uh, it is rare. If you see one when you're digging in the ground, just leave it. It is doing an amazing job hey. eating soil. Hey, Dan, yes. Sorry to interrupt you, but it sounds like there's something really loud uh, on top of your mic, like maybe something moving around on the mic. Oh, sorry. Those are my notes. I will be ah, yes. more careful. I apologize. So these are going to be um, just cruising around, eating, you know, a lot of doing a lot of good above ground while the larva is doing a lot of good below ground. And then, of course, I like just to give the dragonflies a shout out. I feel like we kind of forget them a little bit. Um, they are super important because of where we live. We live around marshlands and lakes and ponds and creeks and so forth. They are going to lay their eggs in these waterways around vegetation and muddy creek, creek bottoms or on the water as well. Those eggs will hatch and these uh, nymphs can live in the water anywhere for a couple of weeks up to a couple of years before they emerge as an adult dragonfly. And then that dragonfly is going to uh, roam um, in a radius of three miles from its home just hunting for flying insects, such as fungus gnats, mosquitoes, other flies, and so forth. They do an amazing job keeping a lot of flying insects uh, populations down. But here's the deal. Uh, because they live for such a long time in the waterways, it's they're very sensitive to pesticides. So yet another reason to be really mindful uh, that a lot of the um, uh, commercial uh, or conventional pesticides uh, find their ways into the waterways and actually will um, reduce these populations. So when we go for a pesticide, if we need to use it, please always go for an alternative that's going to be less toxic and that won't pose, pose any harm to our waterways. All right. Now, for those of you that don't like spiders, I am so sorry. Um, I know, I tried to pick some nice pictures. These are uh, my little garden spiders that I see around. Trust me, I'm not a fan of spiders either. Uh, this is a little crab spider. They are very, very tiny, a very common uh, spider that we will see in our gardens. Understand that most of the spiders that we see in the garden are not web weavers. They are actually going to be hanging out on the ground or hanging out at the base of flowers, as you see in these pictures, waiting for prey to come to them so that they can pounce on them and eat them. So uh, there's only a small percentage, uh, I believe it's about, you know, uh, 30% or 20% of spiders we see in the garden that are actually web weavers. And those are the ones that are closer to Halloween where you have to walk through the gardens going like this so we don't get a big web on our face. But understand that spiders are one of the most beneficial insects globally. So if we, um, because there's spiders on every continent, if we were to gather up all the bugs, all the food that all the spiders eat in a year, it would equal the weight of 50 million people. So though I don't like spiders in my house, I know that they're very important and they're eating something less desirable. So I have a higher level of tolerance now and I will scoop them up and I will put them outside. And then when I'm in the garden, trust me, these spiders do not want to, uh, they're more afraid of us than we are of them. They want to avoid us at all costs. So once they see us, they're going to back up and try to get out of our way. 
And then what the heck is this? These are beneficial nematodes. How many of you have heard of beneficial nematodes? This is kind of fun. Yeah, this is neat. So beneficial nematodes are really cool. They are microscopic worm-like organisms that naturally live in the soil, feeding off of soil dwelling insects, such as fungus gnat larva, vegetable leaf miner larva. So for that person that had the question about the leaf miners, this, understand that the larva overwinters in the soil. This is how we, um, you know, break that life cycle. We inoculate our soils with beneficial nematodes. So they can feed off of it. Uh, flea larva, cutworms, coddling moth, no, I'm sorry, um, cabbage moth maggots, uh, excessive ant colonies, flea larva. They, there's a number of species. There's about three in the um, garden centers, uh, three species of beneficial nem nematodes that are available and uh, regularly in our local garden centers that we can purchase. Uh, thrips, uh, pupa, they're going to feed off of. So take a look when you buy the nematodes, they'll have a huge list of insects that they will feed on. So make sure you get the right species. Here is a uh, uh, fungus gnat larva with nematodes attacking it. So when I say that these are microscopic, look at the fungus gnat larva is already very, very tiny and hardly recognizable with the naked eye. And then here are the nematodes attacking it. So they're even smaller. So super cool. Check them out. All right. And then of course, we don't want to forget about our native bees. We have over 1600 native bee species in California. They're cruising around in our gardens and it's so fun to see them nowadays. Um, I want to share that 30% uh, of our native bees are actually going to be, uh, you know, nesting in tubes or tunnels, some type of like maybe a um, a wood block or burrow into wood like the carpenter bee or in reeds or in bamboo canes, something like that. Whereas 70% of our native bees are actually ground dwellers. They are going to take their homes in, uh, find them in like abandoned beetle hives that are, you know, little beetle tunnels that are in the soil. Because of this, Though it's important to mulch our gardens, especially with a nice chunky mulch, because so many of the beneficial insects we've talked about so far love that chunky mulch because they can hide in it and they can nest in it and they can kind of uh, rest in a safe spot. We always wanna leave a section of the garden uncultivated and bare so that we can, um, our ground nesting bees can have uh, access to these little abandoned tunnels. Now, how do we invite all of these beneficial insects we've talked about? Well, we're going to plant a variety of flowers. So what do these flowers have in common? There's a number of things. First, you might say, oh, they're all brightly colored. Yes. And remember, white is even a color in the garden that's very bright. Uh, you might say, oh, they're all in the um, aster family or composite. You know, they look like daisies. This is true. And that's really important because check this out. Though we might see that Glardia or that Eridron or that Cosmo or even the Aster in my background as a single flower, it's those petals. Those are the rays. And it's the button in the middle uh, that's actually hundreds of tiny little uh, flowers. And the reason why that's so important is because most of our beneficial insects are tiny. So we want to offer tiny flowers for them. Um, remember, it's the adult that is also going for a nectar feeding or going to be a pollinator. So uh, not all of the adults are eating insects, only some of them, but they're also enjoying nectar and pollen. Now, we also want to plant flowers that are in clusters, such as the yarrow or the alyssum. Now, yarrow, though it looks like it's a, you know, a flat top of lots of little flowers, well, among those little flowers are even smaller flowers because it's, again, petals. Those rays are around small petals. So flowers for our beneficials are going to look like daisies or sunflowers. It'd be a list of like this. Um, Rebecca's, calendulas, coreopsis, asters, uh, echinacea, and so forth. Or clusters, flowers that grow in clusters would be like mint and parsley, oregano, ceanothus, and so forth. All I can share is what you need to do is just simply plant these flowers and the beneficial insects are going to come. Just trust me. All right, 
to get some lists for um, plant lists that will give you some ideas of really great plants to plant for our beneficial insects. You can go to the Our Water, Our World website and you can see this great handout called Healthy Gardens. You can email me or I'll try to remember to email everybody this PDF of our 10 most wanted good bugs in the garden that'll also have a really great plant list. You can also go to our local uh, Sonoma County chapter of the Master Gardeners because they have an amazing list on attracting beneficial insects as well as pollinators, as well as the California Native Plant Society. Our Sonoma County chapter is also going to have an amazing resource for attracting beneficial insects. Now, more garden allies we're going to see. It's going to be birds. Uh, understand birds uh, do an amazing job eating pest insects. Uh, they'll eat beetles and worms and aphids and all kinds of um, insects. And in fact, around the world, they can eat four to 500 metric tons of insects. So they're doing an incredible job. I specifically are going to plant um, the echinacea or coneflower and and sunflowers specifically to attract the birds so that they can have seeds, but they're also going to come into my garden to eat pests. Uh, then the frogs, our garden, um, our garden frogs are also really helpful. This guy I found in my uh, string bean tower. He was in there up high eating aphids and spider mites and slugs and snails. I mean, just doing a great job. And then of course, bats. We have a how many species of bats? Well, over 25 exist in California and they are going to be uh, out at night. Actually, they're the only mammal with wings. They are cruising around doing an amazing job eating uh, the nighttime flying insects such as moths and mosquitoes. Um, and they actually, the state of California relies on bats for this amazing service they do by keeping so much of the pests in check so that we don't have to use as many pesticides on our commercial agriculture. And then the Western fence lizard. This is really super cool. Um, though the Western, Western fence lizard is strictly an insectivore, he is just out there hunting, eating uh, different types of grasshoppers and crickets and spiders and so forth. Um, there's a really cool fun fact. A Berkeley scientist discovered that when ticks will go for a blood feeding on a salamander, I'm sorry, on the western fence lizard, they actually are uh, purged of any Lyme's disease uh, because there is a yet to be determined protein in the blood of the western fence lizard that will neutralize and remove that uh, Lyme's disease microbe that is in the tick. So this is one reason why we do not have Lyme's disease um, in the same level or to the same degree as they do on the East Coast or in other states. Kind of cool. So now we want to talk about setting our gardens up for success. We are going to plant a variety of trees, shrubs, and perennials. Make sure we have a nice selection of flowers and so forth. We're going to offer a water source like this bee bath, which is a shallow glaze saucer with pebbles in it. Pebbles that I did not gather from the beach because I want to avoid uh, increasing salts. I want to just uh, gather pebbles from like a stream bed or just from my garden. Uh, even a garden center, um, and I will fill water up halfway. And the reason why I've got pebbles in there is so that the bees and other pollinators can have a landing pad and access the water without drowning. We'd also like to set up a bird bath for our birds. We wanna let some flowers go to seeds, such as the sunflowers and the echinacea, uh, because these are really important seeds for our birds. We don't wanna deadhead all of our flowers. We want to work with a chunky arbor mulch or a larger size mulch that we can purchase uh, because it is going to not only do an amazing job at uh, reducing water evaporation, but it's also gonna provide shelter for many of our beneficial insects. And then we also wanna leave an area of the garden uncultivated and natural for our ground nesting bees. And then more, most importantly, we want to avoid and reduce pesticides. So, if we need to use a pesticide, sometimes we do. We want to always use as a last resort. We want to know that pest and only target that pest. 
We are not going to spray the entire garden. We are only going to apply where it is needed to uh, manage the pest we're trying to uh, get rid of. We always want to choose the less toxic and eco-friendly. We are going to spray well at the end of the day after the sun has gone down. This is the best time to spray. And the reason why is because our pollinators are going to be back in their dens, in their hives, uh, resting for the night, as well as our beneficial insects are going to be less likely to be active. We're going to avoid spraying trees when they're in bloom. And we are also going to understand the, um, the consequences of our actions. We really want to understand what is the mode of action, what is the active ingredient, what is it doing, and how it can impact other things around our garden. And we most importantly want to avoid use, using products that contain neonicotinoids. Neonicotinoids or neonics are systemic. Uh, they either are applied as a soil drench or they can be applied as a spray, a topical spray that absorbs into the uh, plant tissue and will uh, be accessed through all parts of the plant, uh, including the pollen. So when we use these types of products, they are also going to impact our beneficials our, uh, and our pollinators, and it is also going to kill them. So please, please, please avoid using these products. I can tell you, we do not need to use them. We can manage the pests without these uh, more effectively. And if you ever have questions, please reach out to me. A great resource that you can check out is on the UCIPM website, which is the Bee Precaution Pesticide Rating, which will give you information on the pesticides that you might be using in your home. Uh, look up the active ingredients and see how they're impacting our uh, beneficials and our pollinators. Because I'd like to share, when we are trying to manage pests, pest identification is number one. Most of the bugs we're seeing in the garden, over 90% are beneficial insects. So if we have a pest out there, we want to identify it. We want to understand its life cycle. We want to understand its habitat and its timing. Sometimes it's going to be short lived like the spittle bug, which pretty much goes away on its own after a couple of weeks. Then once we can identify it, we want to understand, are there any natural predators out there that are going to be present taking care of this population for me? I want to just quickly go through a couple of lookalikes. It is hard to identify pests. So here's our mealy bug destroyer adult, and here's a flea beetle. One is a good bug, one is a bad bug. We also have our cucumber beetle, which is a common garden pest, and we have a mildew, mildew eating lady beetle who feeds on powdery mildew. The cucumber beetle is very bad, and this mildew eating ladybug is very good. And then our last look like we have the damsel bug, which preys on a lot of small insects. And we have a leaf footed bug, which is a pest for tomatoes and pomegranates. So again, it is not easy to identify pests. It takes a little bit of time and effort, but we've got some resources here. We have the Our Water Our World website that you can check out to read those fact sheets. We also have the UCIPM website. Now understand that most pests are very host specific. So if we can identify the plant, that helps us identify the pest. And we can do that with the UCIPM website. UCIPM also has some really cool tools such as these quick tips for uh, beneficial predators and a nice list of all the different types of ladybugs we might see in our garden. We also have this great resource I want to turn you on to, which is the bugguide.net. If you've got a, a bug in your garden, you don't know what it is, take a picture of it. You can email it to them and they will respond and give you an answer with a proper identification within a couple of hours and, and as short as 30 minutes. I use this resource a lot. It's so fantastic. And then we also have a really cool website I want to just uh, share with you. It's the National Pesticide Information Center. Uh, not only does it go through and explain how those active ingredients of your pesticides work, the mode of action, the toxicity levels, and so forth, but there's a really cool list of natural enemies that we're going to see in our garden and who they're feeding on. So check this out. And in close, what I'd like to share is that when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. Everything is connected. So I'd just like to share it. This is my little hoverfly friend that landed on my thumb, what a treat. 
So I want to thank you so much for your time and your attention and for joining us today. I uh, That was fast and furious. I do apologize, but I wanted to make sure for those of you that had to live at 11, I got you kind of close, but let's finish with your questions. And for those of you that, you know, if questions come up again, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I am always available. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we have lots of great questions. Somebody did want you to go back to the slide showing the carpet beetle. Um, so maybe we could just go back to that real quick. Which beetle? Uh, the carpet beetle, she said, or he says. I don't have a carpet beetle. I have um, a mildew eating beetle that looks like the carpet beetle. Carpet beetle is going to be outside as a pollinator. It looks very similar to this, but inside they're eating uh, fabric. Okay. Um, and then someone else wanted to ask about what the bug website was again. Oh yeah, let's go there. It is bugguide.net. Really cool. I've had to utilize Great. it multiple times this year. Great. So then we've got some really interesting questions on here. Um, somebody wanted to know when you found your uh, fava beans that had all the mealybug destroyers and the ladybug uh, larva on it, what did you do? Did you go out and cut that down anyways? Do you save it for the habitat value? You know, sometimes you need to get rid of a plant just because it's time, if that was a cover crop, for instance. So what did you do in that situation or what would you advise? That is such a great question. Thanks for asking it. I was going to go back to the picture, but I thought maybe for those of you that wanted to just copy this website down, I won't. Um, so I grow my fava beans as cover crops to take advantage of that free nitrogen that they give um, to my soil for my future crops. But this year I was very busy. And I didn't get to cut them down in time. So they grew and then I was going to save them to harvest the beans so that I could have my surplus for more plants in the future. And again, I didn't have the time. I was very behind schedule getting into my garden this spring. And when I finally got out there, I saw that they are covered with that black bean aphid. Understand we've got like 400 different species of aphids. They're all different colors and they really do have their favorite plants. So this black aphid was just covered on the fava beans and it looked gross. And I was about to cut it down. However, when I started to look a little closer, I started to see all those ladybug eggs. All those clutches of ladybug eggs were underneath. There was lots of clutches of ladybug eggs, all these little clusters, all these little like pockets. And there was a lot. So I waited and then I started, cause I also saw a lot of ladybugs. And then I um, started to see a lot of ladybug larva because that's what happens when the eggs hatch. And uh, they were pretty much all over the garden. And the funny thing is, is that I kept hearing that there was like a ladybug shortage at the retailers. And I was like, well, all you got to do is just make sure you've got food for them and they will come and they will stick around. So from there, I started to notice other beneficial insects like lace wings were coming around and they were cruising and fly, uh, around my borage and my daffodils. And then I started to see soldier beetles like in the largest volume of population I'd ever seen in my life, swarming the fava beans and other plants that now these aphids were on. Now these aphids were not bothering any of my new food crops. I had a lot of seedlings. I, um, uh, cucumbers and uh, tomatoes and, uh, you know, squash and other beans uh, for my spring and summer crops. They were not on there. I had no aphids. They were only on the plants that were old, stressed, and really had nothing more to give. These are plants that were weakened at the end of their lifespan. This is when uh, typically when we see a lot of pests, they'll hit an, uh, um, a plant when it is done, like when the uh, kale or chard goes to flower, we start to see aphids as well. So I left it. And then what I was doing when I really couldn't take any more, I would cut uh, parts of those fava bean stalks down and I was still laying them in a pile so that the uh, ladybug larva could either leave or the pupa that were on there, that were on leaves or any part of that plant could then uh, emerge as an adult. And if there are any eggs, those eggs could still hatch. And then I gave it quite a bit of time, well over a month to make sure that there were no beneficials. And then I 
put them in my compost. So Great. yes, I do leave the habitat as much as possible because I know how beneficial it is. Very useful, thank you. Um, that actually, you kind of touched on two questions that have also come up. Um, wondering, do uh, can ladybug larva or pupa, can ladybug pupa move? No, they don't move, they just stay there. So great question. Um, they'll just stay there and they'll be there for, like I said, anywhere from five to 15 days. So like I was going out every day watching to see if they emerged, if that adult emerged. It's kind of fun when you see them go from larva to pupa where they're kind of half and half. I don't know, it's just a trip. It's so fun. So then someone also wanted to know, you were talking about the ladybug shortage and someone wanted to know if you recommend buying ladybugs at a nursery. Um, that is a little bit of a controversial question. I will say, yes, it is fun, especially if we've got kids in the family to buy ladybugs and release them. Um, however, we're also, you know, harvesting them from their environment. So uh, I'll just say it's up to you. It's up to you. But what I can share is all we have to do is plant a variety of flowering things and have a welcoming environment. And we are going to have gardens loaded with beneficial insects. Great. Um, so speaking of attracting beneficial, someone wants to know what plants support soldier beetles? Oh, um, I apologize if I didn't mention that. Uh, I know that they like, um, I've seen them cruising around borage they're eating nectar and pollen. Um, so any of the, these plants that offer, offer nectar and pollen, like the alyssum, like the cosmos, um, like the um, yarrow, I mean, I see them right now cruising around, um, again, planting a variety of things that look like daisies or sunflowers. So anything like in the aster family um, is really going to do a number. It's going to be an amazing uh, attracting beneficials, including the soldier beetles. Great. Um, someone is wanting to know um, whether sluggo is bad for beneficials. Um, sluggo is um, iron phosphate mixed with a, like a yeasty attractant and it is intended for slugs and snails to feed on. So it doesn't really have um, anything that would attract beneficial insects, like beneficial insects have no interest in eating that because they're really just going for a protein meal or the adults, the adults aren't eating insects. They're also going for pollen or nectar. Yeah. Okay. And then next question, um, uh, another, you know, talking about different sprays and things. This one is wanting, she says, uh, hi, thanks for this. I'm new to gardening this year. I've been using a Castile soap, but it's peppermint and water spray for aphids. And is that safe for beneficial insects? Because she's read some conflicting things. Okay, really good question. And thank you for using Castile soap. That is the only true soap on the market. Anything else is a detergent. And um, many of the detergents on the market actually have very toxic things in it. So if for any of you that are going to use a homemade remedy, it can only be Castile soap. And um, here's the deal. Uh, the Castile soap is going to uh, kill soft-bodied insects like aphids, but what else is soft-bodied? Um, ladybug larva, hoverfly larva, lacewing larva, um, mealybug destroyer larva, they're all soft-bodied. So if they're present, they're going to get killed too. Great. Um, somebody is wanting to know, and this is Suzanne. Hi, Suzanne. <laughs> um, uh, whether crane flies eat monarch and uh, pipevine swallowtail eggs and caterpillars um, and, and or which beneficial insects do? I'm not, um, I'm not familiar with that question. I mean, I, I don't know, have an answer, so I apologize. Okay. That's interesting. I'll have to look into that. Yeah. Um, I know this person and could put you in touch if you find Okay. Answers. Yeah, that would be great. It's, I would um, love to reach out. Then somebody's wanting to know, how do you get rid of tobacco bugs that ruin geranium flowers? Um, those are also going to be um, 
uh, like a tomato hornworm. They're a, you know, again, a hornworm and you can actually just pluck them off, feed them to your chickens. Um, here's the thing. Um, they will, uh, they turn into a very important pollinator, which is our hummingbird moth or sphinx moth. So I have some tolerance for them. Of course, I don't want them eating my geraniums or even the tomato ones can take down, a tomato hornworm can take down a six foot tomato in one day, but you know, maybe um, creating a habitat for them, uh, maybe getting them in a terrarium or something where you can feed them so that they can still complete their life cycle. But if we're looking for something, if we don't want to touch them and we're looking for a pesticide, um, there's a beneficial bacteria called Bt. And um, that is going to be very narrow range. It's only going to affect uh, caterpillars because they will ingest it and they will kill it. Hey, somebody's curious about, do you think about, or do you think that the parasitic wasp could help control HLB citrus greening? And I'm not familiar yes. with HLB, so maybe you could define that for people too. Yeah, that's going to be the um, uh, citrus greening, which is a um, invasive pest that's entered California. Um, I believe it was about 2010, give or take. So I apologize. Um, and it is uh, very detrimental to the commercial citrus industry. And yes, they use parasitic wasps to manage that psyllid. It is a psyllid that can transmit a virus that kills the uh, citrus. Um, and yes, they do um, an amazing job with by taking advantage of the parasitic wasps. And then Great. I just also wanted to note, I apologize for saying Lyme's disease. I understand it's Lyme disease. I get a little excited. So sometimes I say words that are not always um, enunciated properly. So thank you for pointing that out. Great. Um, then somebody was wanting to know about carpenter bees that are nesting in the eaves of the house. Um, and is this a problem? If it is, what do you do about it? Yeah, sadly, it's a problem. So, um, I mean, you can have some tolerance. It just depends. Some people are more tolerant than others. Uh, if we, if it's doing, if they're doing significant damage, then um, you're going to want to, you could, you know, puff in a little diatomaceous earth and then plug the hole and that will kill any of the um, bees that are on the inside of that. I've got a follow-up question that's my personal question is I've been told that the carpenter bees tend to uh, be attracted more to wood that's already partially rotten. Um, do they, is that the case or do they go to kind of any wood that's handy? Um, I'm not familiar with that, Kellen. I uh, don't know the answer to that. I know okay. that they will do a number on, uh, you know, sheds and um, roof lines and things like that, eaves. I, I, I don't know if that's true, but you know, if this is a problem in your area, you can, after you've, um, you know, plugged up all those holes, you can also put a really fine netting as a barrier to prevent more from, you know, burrowing into that wood. Okay. Somebody's curious about using neem oil and how that affects beneficials and other insects. Neem oil, uh, though it's, uh, you know, registered for organic use and it's very, um, you know, it's a botanical pesticide comes from the oil of the neem nut. It is very broad spectrum. Um, it is an insecticide, a miticide and a fungicide. So um, if we are using it to control black spot or rust on our roses, we can also risk killing insects such as beneficials. Any beneficial insects that are present, it will um, prevent them from it, it'll uh, break their life cycle because neem has a interesting component to it where it's a growth inhibitor. It prevents adults from laying eggs, eggs from hatching, larva from pupating. It also has anti-feeding properties. So when it's sprayed on the leaf, uh, insects are less likely to come in and chew off of it. So it will also um, prevent beneficial insects from coming in as well. So, but the main part of this it should be the takeaway is yes, it is going to impact beneficial insects. Okay, um, and then I think we're getting towards the end. I've got two more questions here. Um, one about 
neonicotinoids. And this person's just commenting that they should be uh, illegal, but I, I'm not sure that everybody in the group maybe even is familiar with neonicotinoids. So perhaps you could just share a little bit about what they are and how people could make sure that they're not actually bringing them into their garden. Yeah, these are products called imidacolprid was really the hot topic a number of years ago that was all over Facebook and like the bee friendly pesticides. Um, these are products that work like um, systemically where they move through all parts of the plant and they do an amazing job at preventing insects and diseases uh, from damaging that plant. However, they stay in the plant for a very long time. Um, in this case, it could be anywhere from six weeks to 12 months. And that's just for the for that pesticide to be 100% effective. Understand after that time, after that six weeks, the pesticide is still in the plant. So as we apply more, we're just applying even higher concentrations. So the pesticide very well could be in that plant for um, without a reapplication for a number of weeks, if not months afterwards, continuing to kill uh, the pests as well as beneficial insects and pollinators. So these are products that um, if you see something that says it, you know, kills insects up to, you know, three months or six months or 12 months, know that that's, you know, there's, it, there's residuals that are going to impact not only the pests, but the beneficials. Uh, if there's any product that says to water it in and then it'll, you know, um, kill all the pests on that plant, know that it's also going to impact not only the pests that are on that plant, but all of the soil organisms that are around that plant as well. Great, so these you. are just, yeah, these are kind of a recipe for disaster. And sadly, uh, we all got hooked on them or not all, a lot of people got hooked on them because they work really well, but they're bad news. And sorry if I missed that part of the presentation, I had to step out for a second. So um, then the last question here was, is anybody working on increasing restrictions, uh, laws and the such about the availability and sale of toxic pesticides that are available at garden centers? Um, that is such a great question. And um, I talk about this a lot. We as consumers have a lot more power than we know. As a consumer, uh, we get to dictate what uh, products are on the market because the only products that are on market are the ones we're going to buy. So over the years, um, specifically over this past decade of me working as a pesticide educator and IPM educator, we have seen an increase in eco-friendly products uh, on an average increase about 8% at every single retailer throughout the greater Bay Area and Northern California. This is uh, all the retailers that we are in partnership with. Some have a larger increase of uh, sales and some have a shorter or smaller increase. But on an average, we're looking at um, an eight to 14% increase of eco-friendly uh, sales as well as products available on the shelf. And that's because we're buying them. Now, that means the less desirable or the other products are going to be more conventional pesticides or the problem pesticides that are more toxic. Now, if we stop buying those other pesticides, those pesticides are going to slowly just disappear. Um, so it's really education and it's our, our you know, uh, buying power that's going to make the difference. And it's you know, supporting uh, programs like Our Water, Our World and, you know, uh, this partnership and really learning about what's going on in your garden and understanding that there is a rare occasion that you need to go for a pesticide. And if you need support or help or have questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. I will get you the information. And if I don't know it, I will find out because I have, uh, I grow food professionally, I grow flowers professionally, and I've been a gardener professionally for a long time. And it is a rare occasion that I need to use a pesticide. So there's a lot of ways around the pesticide usage. And then one more question popped in. Um, can you name a few shade tolerant flowers that support beneficial insects? Yes. Give me a second. My brain is not in that mode yet. Yeah. So um, really, we're going to look for things that, okay, so 
oh shade tolerant i have to look in the book really quick but i know alyssum can take some shade um some aridrons take shade uh it can anything i'm sorry my brain isn't really even yarrows can take some shade um, i know also. that um yeah thanks kellen i know that um uh the hookahs mm -hmm. um are good for some of the larger pollinators but or some of the larger beneficials but if it's too dark of shade uh if the environment is too cold you're not going to have a tendency to see many beneficials if it's too cold like if it's dark and cold but if it's warm shade you'll see beneficials and gwen if you um need more there's some great resources where you can look up um i'm trying to remember the name of the website right now jesus is escaping me um definitely the resources uh, yeah. yeah it's in the resources page but there's a, a website where you can look up you know i'm looking for plants that attract insects that are in the shade in my climate zone and it's on the um cal one of the california native uh yeah calscape web pages calscape thank yeah. you yeah uh yeah calscape would be a good place to look yeah and they're on the resource page Great. they're awesome well that's all of our questions. Um, thank you all so much for attending and thank you so much, Suzanne and Heather for sharing all of your knowledge with thank us. Thank you, Heather, I really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully everyone can join us for the next program, which is June 12th. We're gonna talk about protecting our gardens through a drought where I'll dive a little bit more into all the resources that Heather mentioned and uh, different types of tools and things that we can utilize to use less water, but more effectively while protecting our gardens. Great, thank you all. Thank you. Take, Take care. care. Thanks, Bye. Kellen. Yeah, thank you. Have a great day. You too.